آه. اوكي جو اهيد هو الحقيقه التعامل مع المسؤولين في مصر من الصعوبه من مكان لان هم ما عندهمش فيجن انترناشونال اه صح وهم محدود التفكير جدا ومتعينين بالدوله العميقه الديب ستيتس هي اللي معيناها ما انت خد تجارب كثيره معاهم يعني انا متابع انا طلع عيني يور هيستوري كل حاجه بيقفوا فيها يقفوا في في الخير انها ما يمشوا في الشر اه حاجه زباله يعني فمشكله الحقيقه مصر مبليه بشويه الزباله دي ما معلش برضه اللي زي حضرتك اللي زي حضرتك الهيستوري رائعه وعملت اجيال كثيره و والمعهد طبعا بيقدم خدمات رائعه للبلد يعني برضه بس كان ممكن تعمل اكتر لو ادوك الفرصه اه اه كان ممكن نبقى واقفين على رجلينا يعني right. لكن احنا لما ببص انترناشونال بل تعملوش سمعه خالص الحقيقه اما انا حاسس ان طالعه منه فيري بور وملهاش اي مردود والسيرفيس نفسه انا مش مبسوط منه صراحه سيرفيس فيري بور يعني. There is always there is room for improvement always وانا تحت امرك في اي حاجه. اه لان كل هدفنا كله خدمه البلد خدمه ابن الشعب المصري اللي محتاج خبرتنا وخبرتك وخبره الاجيال الجديده وبعدين برضو الاجيال الجديده برضو عاوزين يعني يبقى فيه نوع من دم جديد يستفيدوا من العيوب والميزات وكده يعني. يعني ابسط حاجه يعني من سن من السبعينات لما رجعت من الميموريال هوستل حاولت ابوش فور ريزيدنسي بروجرام. رايت. اند اي فيلد في القطاع الخاص والقطاع العام. رايت. الاثنين ما ما وقفوش ان يعملوا ريزيدنسي بروجرام. مع ان دي بيزك يعني في التعليم من البوست جراديوت اديوكيشن. ان يبقى في ريزيدنسي بروجرام. امال هتعلم الناس دي ازاي من غير بروجرام انا مش فاهم. بقى... هم اصلهم المصلحه العامه أيوة. مش في دماغهم صراحه لها مصلحات شخصيه وبيخاف آه. انك تطلع واد كويس يكمبيت معاه آه يعني من نفس حتى... البرايفت وكلام <تصفيق> يعني زباله يعني طيب خلينا نبعد عن السياسه السياسه شويه يا رب ربنا يبارك فيك يلا العمر والصحه واتمنى لما اجي مصر اشوفك ان شاء الله ان شاء الله على طيب it's 9 p.m. we can uh, we can slowly start. Uh, what? Click on it. Click on what? The left screen. The what? The left screen. Yeah. You already said this recording. Oh. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so if we can, we'll leave full screen. Just the screen. Can you see me? Can you hear me? Can you see the slides? Yeah, yeah we can sure. see the slides. اه نبدا يعني اه انا يعني بشكر الدكتور رفعت ده استاذنا يعني من اجيال سابقه عشان احس عشان بقول كده عشان احس ان انا صغير في السن ودكتور هشام وطبعا يسعدني ان انا يعني ادردش معاكم النهارده Uh, I will try to speak English, but I didn't know how many, uh, sometimes in English, particularly in American yeah. accent, not, not most people understand it, but, but I will to do the combined thing. So we're going to talk. I, I never give this talk before. Actually, I made the talk this weekend, uh, specifically designed uh, for our audience today. And uh, I called it abdominal malignancy and gastrointestinal failure. I'm allowed to run this. How can I run? What? <laughs> Tell me how to run. Oh, oh come on. I think you need to uh, best to are you okay? Yeah, she yeah, okay. She's teaching me wrong. I had one of the very <laughs> 
bright uh, uh, fellow with us from Egypt and she's interested in breast and she's trying to teach me the wrong thing. Okay. Right? Yeah. Slide, slide, not this. Like this? Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. So <clears throat> now I know it. And then now this is the slide. This is, you know, what are the types of abdominal malignancy? Could precipitate gut failure. Uh, it could be uh, coming from the endoderm, ectoderm, or mesoderm, and the organ site could be the gut, for gut, mid gut, hind gut, the liver, the pancreas, the stromal tissue, which is the abdominal cavity is full of stromal tissue. And then the other organ that we don't care about, the, the reproductive and genitourinary, although it definitely play a major role in the development of gut failure in a good number of, uh, of particularly women. And uh, <clears throat> my interest in, um, in, in, uh, in uh, gut failure or in gut in general, because the, the, the gut is really, it's everybody, everybody's mind and brain and heart. I mean, it's the, the gut hemostasis is maintaining the whole body energy equilibrium. But Tariyat al uh, if uh, you charge it too much, as you see in your left hand side here, you get morbid obesity, which is a, a, uh, really in an, a pandemic worldwide and Egypt, Middle East, and even in the United States. And then uh, if you see this in your right hand side, if uh, the, uh, you lose the equilibrium on the other uh, side of the pendulum, you develop, uh, uh, you become Egyptian mommy, you know, severe malnutrition, brain atrophy, and you can't survive. So we're looking for how can we maintain the gut homeostasis like you see in the middle of the uh, in the middle of the uh, of the slide, uh, we always know you say trust your gut because if it's really uh, if you trust your heart, you're gonna have emotional uh, decision. If you trust your gut, you absolutely make the right decision. And most recently, for the last 20, 30 years, we start hearing about the microbiota and the relationship between the gut and the brain. And there is a gut-brain axis that I elaborated on in many recent publications. Uh, Dr. Karim, we're seeing the same slide. Like the slides are not shifting. Are you, is this intentional? Say it again, or, I'm sorry? The slide's not moving with you. I didn't know why. Did you move slides? Because it's the same slide we're, uh, we're seeing. I think she's doing, uh, she's making a different format and that is creating some issues. Okay, now you're right. And hey, can you see it now? No, they can't. I'm still no, there. you need to start sharing your screen now. Right. I have to. I have to do what? Yeah, I, yeah. I did what you asked me to do. Okay, right. Can you see it now? Yes. All right. And you can see here. <laughs> Yeah, try to go back and forth just so we make sure it's. Uh, I mean, you moving. can go anywhere. Okay, this is problem. What do you mean it's <laughs> my problem? <laughs> all right. Well, let's do it like we do it all the time. Uh, if there's something, forget about where it's at. You just. Yeah, perfect. Now do yeah, but it doesn't move. Okay, okay, hold on a second. Can we get Brandon? Yeah, I'm getting it. Can it? Yeah, it doesn't move. It's moving now. Can you see that? Yeah. Can yes. It now? Yeah. now it's moved. Yep. Okay. okay. So you can see here the connection between the gut and the brain, and there is definitely a, a strong correct con connection through a neuropeptide uh, cascade. That's why most recent publications in the psychiatric uh, uh, field uh, showing that the microbiota and the gut play a major role in, uh, in major psychiatric disorders. Can you see this now? 
Yes, yes, okay, we can. Okay, good, good, so we're good. And that's why I think uh, this Judge Billing, the guy from England, uh, more than a century ago, uh, uh, wrote this uh, statement in one of his books. And uh, it's actually, this is the way he wrote it, that the fanatical thing. He said, I have finally come to the conclusion that a good, reliable set of bowels is worth more to a man than any quantity of brains. So uh, we have been always biased towards gender. So men and should be men and women, but it is absolutely true. And all the recent data showing that. For our young generation, whoever with us on the, uh, on the line, that the definition of gut failure is the significant loss of anatomical and or functional cell mass or intracyte cell mass that result in nutritional deficiencies. And the gut creates the intestine in a certain way, it had a huge surface area, as you can see in this slide. The only, the only parameter that can measure to some extent to the enterocyte cell mass is the plasma citrulline. And once you, uh, and the measurement is not really too complicated. It's, it's, it's one of the profile of the, uh, of the uh, of the chemic of the chemistry or the variable that we measure on routine basis, and uh, if you have a significant loss in the plasma citrulline, uh, mean that that you have uh, insufficient enterocyte cell mass, and you can define the intestinal failure uh, if it's temporary or permanent based on the level of the citrulline. In the paper uh, we published in 2019 in the Annals of Surgery, um, and I would elaborate on it in the next talk, is that uh, we defined the three different types of gut failure. Uh, on your left hand side, they call it surgical gut failure. It's anatomical surgical gut failure, either due to multiple reasons. And then you see in the middle, mucosal gut failure mean the disease of the endoderm and mucosa of the gut with poor absorption, uh, even if you have the entire length. And then the one that on your right hand side, and they're seeing a lot of it in Egypt now, <clears throat> the uh, neuromuscular dysfunction or the gut dysmotility, I call it gut dysmotility, is the disruption of the neuroenteric uh, uh, system of the gut. And I'll tell you why I'm saying that. In the pathology of the gut failure, accordingly, could be you lose the organ, any organ in the abdomen, due to the removing the tumor or something else, or due to the reason you remove the tumor. Surgical complications could be anatomic disruption, gastrointestinal fistulae that disrupt the flow through the gut, and vascular thrombosis. And you see it uh, quite uh, more frequent with patients who had a Whipple. Um, and hepatobiliary surgery, and then they get compromised of blood supply and you develop portomesenteric vena thrombosis. The third one is radiation entritis because of the irradiation, particularly on patients who received the irradiation years and years ago before the irradiation technique was not sophisticated as of today, but still happen. And then some of this patient even uh, have cancer or neoplastic disorder, they could have associated gut disorder like inflammatory bowel disease. And also some of this patient de developed neuromuscular disorder, either primary or due to the associated uh, pathology. But one thing I want our uh, young generation surgeons that when you have organ loss, try to reconnect to the gut. It doesn't matter if you have enough intestine for the patient to, to absorb or not. You're trying to retain the enteric and, and gastrointestinal secretion within the system, give him better quality of life, reduce the risk of abdominal infection, and they can live on TPN uh, until we do something for them, transplant or whatever uh, is available to do for them. So please, when you have patients like this and you lost most of the gut after any uh, oncologic surgery uh, uh, due, due to the extent of the tumor, et cetera, try to reconnect to the gut. And the colon is my, uh, actually my friend. 
uh, because it saved on most of the patients who have foregut surgery and they lost everything. Uh, and this is uh, for those who had um, uh, colorectal surgery or pancreatic surgery, and they have a still a small intestine you can uh, retrieve. And you can see here pictures of the surgical complications, which could happen with anybody. Uh, there is no surgeon in the world that is immune from technical complications. And that I tell all my young generations everywhere, the pathology is your main enemy. Uh, it sometimes override your surgical skills, but you have really learned how to handle the pathology uh, despite, regardless of your surgical experience, and that will help you tremendously. You see here, a multiple fish that is connected, but you can see that in this example of patient had a wibble and then developed portomesenteric venous thrombosis. And the uh, in the paper we published in 2019, uh, in brief, uh, you can see here uh, the, uh, the uh, purple color, this gut GI malignancy was behind the development of gut failure in 8% of the total, total, total population of 500. And also mucosal disease due to irradiation enteritis, it presents a good number of uh, patients who have mucosal gut failure, about one third, 21%. And you could see here, as I showed you earlier, some of these patients have malignancy and have neuromuscular disorders. So there is always a secondary neuromuscular disorder, either due to the hormone secreted by the tumor or the patient has primary uh, uh, dysmotility and then they develop malignancy. And the pathology of the gut nucleus, you guys, the one who should teach me this slides, you can see you have benign and malignant. We're gonna focus on Gardner syndrome, neuroendocrine tumors, Stromal tumors and then adenocarcinoma, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's a whole uh, host of, of uh, uh, malignant uh, disorders. We're going to focus in few of them, particularly those I'm seeing more and more now, even in the United States, as well as in Egypt. The risk for development of gut fa failure, we cannot just blame ourselves all the time. If the tumor factor the size or the burden of the tumor, the site of the tumor may force you to do a curative resection to uh, sacrifice some of the, or part of the organ, the stage of the tumor, the pathology of the tumor, the biology of the tumor also. The surgeon has to take it in consideration when handling uh, the surgical specimen and the technique of surgery. The surgical factors, techniques also, uh, definitely experience matter, and also the resources. Um, you know, if I, if I go and do the same case in the United States, uh, rather than do it in Australia, for example, definitely I don't have the facilities to make me do what I want to do. So I have to uh, 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 modify my technique because of the lack of facilities. So. We always underestimate the resources. And this is a major problem in Egypt because of the private practice. Um, I believe the surgeons in, the, in Egypt are one of the smartest and uh, technically uh, brilliant surgeons in the world, the Japanese and the Egyptian. The problem with the Egyptians is actually Aish make them do it anywhere, somewhere in the middle of the night. It doesn't matter how skillful you are, you will definitely hurt to the patient. The risk of developed malignancy, you guys know more than I do. All this hereditary, sporadic colorectal, hereditary syndrome, Crohn, celiac disease, alcohol, all this, a whole list that we teach the medical student about it. One thing you pay attention to is the risk of, in, of mid gut malignancy, the gut, not the pancreas or liver, is much lower than the colorectal. Why? Because there is rabbit turnover to the intestinal mucosa. 
The intestine has a very low bacterial load and microbiota, which could be carcinogenic production. And the intestinal mucosa has a very high level of IgA, which is immunoprotective. Here are the hereditary or familial syndromes. I almost see an example of all of the syndromes in Egypt. And without uh, a transplant, sometimes my hands are tied to help them out. We're going to focus on the familial adenomatous polyposis, which you all of you are familiar with. And this is an example of a patient with Gardner syndrome and massive um, uh, mesenteric mass and abdominal wall mass. As you can imagine this, then I'll tell you what we should do for patients like this. This is unbelievable. And I see this very often in Egypt now because they go for chemotherapy and I don't understand how the physician think what chemotherapy is gonna do for a mesenteric tumor or dysmoid tumors, I have no idea. They still do it in the States too. I have a patient who referred to me a week ago, girl from Dubai. They were treating her with chemotherapy for three years, for God's sake. It just broke my heart. And this is an example of a neuroendocrine tumor. One of our guys called me to see if I can help him. You can see here, did you see this? Huge, huge tumor burden. Uh, this is the mesenteric mass. There was paraortic lymph nodes. The liver is fully st studded with neuroendocrine tumor. And I love, the, I love these types of stromal and, and endocrine tumor because they low grade malignancy, you can help them and you can make a difference in their life even without a transplant. I'll show you a slide showing how they respond to therapy. Here is the neuroendocrine tumor. I didn't want to give you a headache. Um, I didn't know what type you have over there. It's 39 o'clock. Um, you can see here the neuroendocrine tumor. All of you know about this. I really don't, I'm not here to tell you what you know. Um, and the, the, just we need to pay attention to the new WHO classification for the neuroendocrine tumor. Uh, there is crucial factors that cell differentiation and proliferation rate. If you send it, you, have, you need to have a good pathologist to give you uh, this accurate information, I'm not saying it's a neuroendocrine tumor. So what? Uh, so we have to be a little bit more scientific. The histologic grades, as you can see here, because it affects your outcome and it affects your management strategy. And the uh, determined factors uh, in general are the morphological characteristic, the mitotic index, and the CHI-67. The staging, the problem with the neuroendocrine and even dysmoid tumor or other stromal tumors is preoperative imaging, no matter what you do, is underestimate or understage the tumor. The only way to do, give accurate uh, staging is intraoperative examination and the vision of the surgeon and the surgical skills and the experience. Uh, to make be more disease specific, because there's many subtypes of the neuroendocrine tumor, the molecular staging is actually needed. And sometimes you do it post-operative, but it will help you for uh, uh, further post-operative management. And it's uh, for the neuroendocrine tumor, you see how the multi-modality treatment, I'm not gonna uh, go through this because you know better than I do, but there is a rule for autotransplantation and the intestinal multivisceral transplantation as well as even isolated liver transplantation. And you, you're familiar with the new adjuvant therapy and the selective internal radiotherapy. The, uh, risk factor for survival, of, uh, you all know, the tumor site, the multicentricity, the lymph node metastasis, hepatic metastasis, all of the above. Why I'm putting this here? Because it's affect your decision-making process. And if the patient is a candidate for reconstruction or transplant, uh, this also you have to put in consideration because you don't want to waste organs. So they all connected. 
And as you can see here, based on data published in 2003 uh, in the neuroendocrine tumor of the, uh, of the uh, mid-gut, jejunum and ileum, you can see here uh, nodal disease, liver metastasis give you a worse diagnosis. Uh, and with the liver, if you manage liver metastasis, it give you the worst diagnosis. But if you surgically intervene, you have an excellent outcome. Actually, the hepatic resections have a better outcome than transplantation uh, because of the tumor recurrence. As you may know, uh, Steve Jobs died uh, from recurrent neuroendocrine tumor after a liver transplantation. This is another, actually, this is an Egyptian patient uh, waiting for me to come to Egypt to do him. This is a gastrointestinal stroma tumor. Um, and even when they send me this CAT scan, I said, or MRI, I said, this is a just tumor. And even, and then sure enough, they did a biopsy and just a tumor. I said, what did you do the biopsy for? That is no, but no patient will survive this unless it's a low grade stroma tumor. And uh, you can see here the origin of uh, the, uh, I have a, a special interest in the interstitial cell of Cajal, and that is the origin of the uh, GIST tumors. Uh, it could happen anywhere. Uh, the literature saying uh, frequent side terminal ileum, but I see it more. Uh, in the peri in the peripancreatic and perigastric area, area, you can see one of the tumors. It had a lot of uh, biologic markers here, and the histology could be spindle cell or epithelioid cells, and that could confuse the pathologist. And the, the immunohistochemical stains is specific for the stroma tumor, is CD one seventeen and CD thirty four, and the treatment again. Segmental organ resection is the standard of care in the central core if you're really looking for your patient to get, uh, to get cure. Um, uh, there is a notion in some centers, in some countries, they're giving biologic treatment because it's a new kid in the block and waiting for the tumor to shrink. Uh, uh, I'm not sure about that. I think if you have good surgical skills, you will definitely uh, will do the uh, curative resection with free margin uh, and with limited uh, uh, with preservation of uh, part of the organ. And but the thing is that uh, tell my uh, uh, colleagues that listening to me, avoid rupture of the tumor capsule. Be fine and careful surgeon. Do fine surgical techniques because you, pay, you will hurt to the patient if you rupture the capsule of the tumor. Even if you remove it, the whole tumor and you leave residual tumor after the rupture, the cells um, uh, implanted on the, on the peritoneum and they grow like nobody else's business. Uh, you didn't have to do lymphadenectomy, however, I always do sampling of the lymph nodes to give myself an assurance that I did the best for the patients, although it's not necessarily. Uh, the uh, stromal tumor in the liver because of the vascularity and the lack of a capsule sometimes is difficult to resect. Uh, but you could uh, definitely, uh, uh, if you have a small lesions or whatever, you can do radiofrequency or if you superficial to the surface, you still can safely resect it. Uh, the uh, molecular targeted therapy definitely play a major role in the evolution uh, of the therapy of the field, uh, either pre-op or post-op, but it's not the mainstay of therapy. The mainstay of therapy is surgical curative resection. And you can see here, the, uh, the see the difference in survival, uh, these five, months period obviously has to be an aggressive tumor. You can see the segmental organ resection have the best outcome. Uh, the prognostic variables, if you really have time uh, to talk to your patient, treat him as a normal human being, tell him exactly. Although sometimes when I talk to the surgeon or physician in Egypt, that the patient doesn't understand, do not under underestimate 
the psychology of the patient, the intelligence of the patient, and you have to take your time and tell them exactly what you know and anything, everything about their disease. And this is, you have to share it with the tumor. And I see it most of the time, the family came to me, don't tell him anything, he has to go because the patient wants to understand the issues. They usually interact with you and they help you to cure them or treat them properly. Again, tumor rupture, extent of surgical resection. Uh, the male, unfortunately, uh, the males are, uh, the male gender is, uh, is a uh, bad prognostic variable tumor size more than five centimeter. And uh, I'll be honest with you, more important than all of this is the scales of the surgery. So what are we gonna do if the patient develop gut failure or gastrointestinal failure due to gastrointestinal tumors? And now you're dealing with patients on TPN or required TPN either before because of a short gut syndrome or a tumor impairing the gut function. Uh, the medical treatment, if you have somebody with short gut syndrome, then don't let them die, please. Uh, give them a total prevention and nutrition. And I'm pushing very hard to have a home total prevention and nutrition therapy in Egypt. And it's getting better and better every day. And then there is a new drug called GLB2 or GATX. It's unfortunately is about $200,000 a year therapy. It does help a good number of patients. And the surgical one, that's the one I usually try to help the patients in Egypt do the autologous reconstruction and the surgical remodeling, which I shared it with you. Uh, the paper in the, uh, if, if, if any of the audience are interested to know more, uh, there is a paper in 2019 in the Annals of Surgery uh, discussing all what we're talking about in this slide. And then intestinal and multivisceral transplantation, either UTU or allotransplantation. And I always tell the patient, there is nothing better than your own gut. I have the pleasure, even if I spend 14 hours in the operating room to save every inch of the gut of the patient, like patient I'm doing today from Abu Dhabi, it gives me a great pleasure to protect them from uh, having a transplant because transplant is not without a problem. You have an umbilical cord, immunosuppression, particularly in the Middle East and in the, in the developing or underdeveloped country, uh, you do everything possible to rehabilitate the gut, try to avoid the need for transplant. And uh, I show you the three medical, surgical and transplant. It's a dynamic process. And this paper in 2019, for the first time introduced the, uh, the notion and, uh, and the strategy of the integrative management. You play with the three variables between uh, autologous reconstruction to surgical remodeling to biologic treatment and transplant if we fail all of the above. And here the slide showing just to give you some audiovisual thing. This is the intracyte biologic agents. Uh, this is a growth hormone. This is GLB2. And I had the pleasure to be on the panel of the FDA to approve both drugs. And then uh, surgical remodeling, trying to lengthen the bowel. And they do a lot of this in Egypt nowadays. And whoever uh, interested in listening to me, uh, once you know I'm in Egypt, you're more than welcome. Uh, I did some cases in Aswalaini, uh, some cases Gawi, some cases now for Mustache Finesse. You're more than welcome to come at uh, uh, any of these places, wherever I am, and I'll help you to learn how to do it. It's a very simple procedure. Autologous reconstruction is a little bit more complicated, but can be done. And this is the surgical remodeling or the bowel lengthening. Uh, this operation was uh, developed by a medical student at, ha at uh, Mass General, Dr. Kim. And uh, it's a very valuable procedure. As you can see, do the zigzag lines of the small bowel 
I developed this technique, the same technique, but I did it for the colon for the first time. And I call it serial transverse coloplasty. And uh, it is uh, published in the 2019 paper. For the uh, treatment or autologous gut surgery for patients with abdominal malignancy or gut malignancy, tumor resection in the main stay, if you can do with free margin. And then when you Excuse do- me, Dr. Karim, can you tell us more about the surgical remodeling, whether in the intestine, in the small intestine or in the colon? Like is, what is the concept is to increase the surface area and how, how much does it increase? Like, yeah, do you we have can any talk studies? about, I'm gonna talk next time, right? Ah, okay. Yeah, yeah well, well I'm, uh, you know, we're gonna have, we got, if you want me to talk every week, I'll talk with you every week. But I, you know, let's, I wanna focus in the main thing. We didn't okay. wanna go to details, okay? And you can see here the reconstructive surgery. Um, they tell my guys here, and in the paper you have, the gut is not one organ. You have a foregut, you have a midgut, you have hindgut according to the blood supply, the celiac, the SMA, and the IMA. And then the remodeling procedure, which uh, uh, next topic we can talk in more details about that stuff. And this is an example of the uh, neuro, uh, uh, we have a endocrine surgeon who uh, came to me, he said, Kareem, can you come and help me with this? And then when I saw this, I said, what is that? He said, I cannot do anything. Let's close him and we can give him chemotherapy. I said, you're crazy. So I actually took a bite. I, um, I kindly asked him to go do something else. And I spent about 12 hours, removed all the tumor, saved all the intestine uh, without autotransplant and removed all the paraortic lymph nodes. I did about 38 liver res segmental resection of metastatectomy, 38. And this is the patient after two years. I just saw him last week. He had two, only two residual tumor and they may go back and take them out, but his life is totally different. He's my age, uh, 69 going to 70. And I thought that uh, that would be better for him than a transplant. And when you do gut reconstruction, there is two major surgical principles. You have to restore the alimentary flow and spare any native organ, partially or totally. If you, if you adopt it to these two principles, you will, all, you will help a lot of patients. And this is an example, and this figure is actually published in the Annals of Surgery. Uh, you know, like the patient I'm doing right now, I use this jejunum to connect to the esophagus to the duodenum because you wanna restore the alimentary flow for the foregut, okay? And uh, here patient have, uh, uh, this actually was not a, a tumor patient, but gastric bypass patients uh, with multiple fistulae, see four, two, three anastomoses were done. And then also in the mid gut, you reconstruct three, four anastomoses and the hind gut in the same way, try to restore the alimentary flow. And the same thing here for the foregut in the esophagus, uh, colon interposition, I did it for five, six patients for the thoracic surgery department here. And the patient has gastric pull up before colon uh, bypass before both failed. So I didn't have enough colon. So I connected him here and get a free forearm of flap and patient did well. Uh, patient have Crohn's disease here. Uh, any uh, regular surgeon would do Whipple or would do resection or gastro J, took piece of the colon, patch the duodenum, maintain the alimentary flow. And the, there is some patient who created the new stomach, used the jejunum, and instead of having the, like you do the alien pouch, I do gastric pouch with jejunal conduit. If they got transplantation, we, we, we close to, if uh, you start getting uh, tired, uh, we're gonna, we're gonna, we're very close to the end. Here, uh, if you fail all of the above, or you don't have enough gut to play with, then gut transplantation. Um, uh, 
is the way to go. And gut transplantation means intestinal and multiviscera with its many different prototypes. Uh, this is an autotransplantation, a micro leaks K2 and New York, interested in autotransplantation. Take the tumor, take the organs out, put them in the UW solution, like uh, what uh, Amr and his colleagues does the live donors, livers, and then take the tumor out, reconstruct the vessel, put it back in. Uh, to be honest with you, uh, my philosophy of this, if you take more time and you have good surgical skills, you could do this without doing the autotransplant. And if you cannot do it, mean that your tumor is beyond the resection and you will definitely leave residual tumor. The types of, uh, multi of intestinal and multivisceral transplant or the allo transplant, the yellow color is the uh, transplanted organ, the red is the native. This intestine alone, liver and intestine, we usually give them pancreas with them. And full multiviscera, which is stomach, duodenum, pancreas, intestine, and liver. And then uh, in uh, 2000 or 1993, I developed the technique, modified multiviscera to save the native liver because everybody was struggling to get organs. So that solved some of the problems. So you can give the liver to one patient but, and they modified multiviscera to the gut failure patient whose liver is still okay. Their limitation for the gut transplantation patient with oncologic, uh, oncologic uh, problem is there will have to be strict inclusion criteria because of the uh, immunosuppressant drugs that you're gonna use for them. Uh, and either they develop recurrent tumor, some of them, uh, or sometimes they develop what we call graft versus host disease. So the tumor has to be non-aggressive and uh, no metastatic disease, as you can see with all the imaging studies. And uh, based on the Medicare or HECFA or CMS here or the government regulation that you should not give a transplant for patients who have cancer without being tumor free for up to five years. But if the patient having liver failure, I don't care what the government said, I have to save his life and they do really well. And with the surgery for transplant, particularly the patient that you see with huge tumors, uh, dysmoid mostly and Gardner syndrome, I uh, usually do a two stage operation to remove as much tumor as you can, know your limitation, how many organs are affected. But if you're dealing with only mesenteric tumors that you cannot remove without removing the intestine and everything is free or everything is free of tumor, then you can do a transplant at the same time removing the tumor. This is an example of a patient uh, that um, came to me from Florida. You look at this. This is a Gardner, turn, a Gardner syndrome patient. This all the adenal adenomas, which are precancerous. And then the mesenteric tumor, you can see occupying the whole abdomen. I did him a two-stage operation, removed all this tumor. I know there is nothing uh, will work for him except the full multiviscera. And then I did the multiviscera a few months later. You can see here, I have a nice video, but I didn't have a chance because I went to the operating room to share it with you, but I could share it with you next uh, talk. It's about two or three uh, minutes video. You can see here on your left-hand side that the whole abdominal cavity is empty. Here is uh, your right diaphragm, left diaphragm, the aorta and the cava and the hepatic veins. And this is after the organs back in. And the recurrent dysmoid tumor uh, uh, never happened in the transplant, transplanted organ. And uh, I explained in many uh, papers uh, we published because the genetic makeup of the transplanted organs is not the same as the, uh, the, uh, uh, the recipient or the native organs. And also over the years, I modified the technique, try to preserve the spleen like this, mostly for patients with Gardner syndrome. I removed their pancreas and their duodenum with the intestine and they have their native liver looks good. I leave the spleen and uh, give them modified multiviscera. And they developed this technique particularly in 20 and 2000, in 2000, 2001, 
because the uh, spleen has a lot of advantage on uh, reduce the risk of uh, PTLD and graft versus host disease. And then some patients, if they have anorectal cancer and they lost uh, their rectum, but they have intact anal sphincter, I give them a colon pull through operation. The mortality in patients with gut failure due to, uh, new, due to uh, malignancy, you can see here, the uh, patient who would not candidate for autologous reconstruction or transplant, the mortality, uh, the cause of mortality is 17% due to recurrent or de novo malignancy. And uh, for those who had autologous reconstruction, still uh, uh, development of a de novo second ca cancer because of their immunologic uh, or genetic makeup uh, or a uh, recurrent tumor uh, with the cause of death in 21% of patients. Uh, and then on the trade-off with the transplant, the patient could develop the novo malignancy or PTLD, which is a symbol for of uh, the novo uh, malignancy or lymphoma. And you can see here, that's showing you exactly what I was talking about. Uh, the uh, autologous reconstruction versus gut transplant is a trade-off. You have a higher rate of recurrence tumor here and de novo cancer. And for the transplant, usually BTLD has the uh, more dominant effect compared to the de novo or early malignancy. But essentially very small, but I'm just showing you uh, that, uh, uh, that things could happen. And uh, this is the uh, uh, 2019 papers as well, uh, showing history of, not history, just the history of abdominal malignancy is a risk factor for survival. Not, not necessarily due to a current tumor, but it could be related to immunologic factors, uh, de novo malignancy. I have patient transplanted for dysmoid or Gardner syndrome or uh, just a tumor. And then 10 years after transplant, they develop um, thyroid cancer. A good number develop breast cancer because of the impaired immune surveillance. Uh, as you see it was all organs, it's more so with the small bowel. And there is a paper in 2012, I published in transplantation showing that the novo malignancy with a small bowel and multiviscera. And this is the, you know, it's an algorithm, uh, I think uh, uh, summarizing what I just told you, but we're gonna, gonna, we're gonna go through it uh, in the next talk when we talk specifically about uh, maybe one talk about gut rehabilitation, I've been uh, autologous reconstruction with full technical details, and one about uh, intestinal multivisceral transplantation. I would, uh, uh, this is uh, my history after I left uh, uh, Mansoura. Um, and you can see, if you see here, you see Farouk uh, is in the top picture. Uh, you can see it here. I put it even before. Uh, here you can see Farouk there, um, uh, and he continued to be my hero. And even I put him before Starzl and Dean Warren. If you're familiar with Dean Warren, the two uh, eminent surgeons uh, over the last uh, century in the United States. So here it's my uh, time, uh, tenure time in Pittsburgh when we start doing the transplant. And this is a, a team I built at the Cleveland Clinic. Um, you can see here um, that, uh, that uh, Dr. Farouk, um, uh, Dean Warren, uh, although I spent a few uh, years with him, but we were very connected of uh, those. Uh, I ask all the surgical residents now, medical students, do you know what Warren Shunt is? They know absolutely nothing. And as you all may know, also, Benedul Tutul Amru Saha, Dr. Atif Salam or Atif Abdul Salam. He was my mentor in this area. And uh, I had fun with them at Emory. Um, and then uh, uh, my mentor, Dr. Stasel, who passed away few years ago, uh, we were very close. 
uh, until uh, the day he died. Um, here, uh, that uh, the next talk, Dr. Hashem, Eliezer Ayat Rayak, Vardo Mapsut Gitten, Hatibalak. This we're going to talk, um, next talk will be an evolution of the intestinal and the multivisceral transplantation. And that's. The next it. talk will be on the 28th of February. What's that? I said next talk is on the 28th of February, inshallah. Well, it's going to depend. Uh, sure, we'll see. I could be in Egypt. I could be hidden somewhere uh, because I may have to give a talk at the American Surgical Association, but I will we'll keep in touch. Okay. Anything else? Uh, uh, we can start. Uh, we take a few questions from the audience if uh, you have the time. If you don't have time, uh, I am good now. Dr. Osman hasn't called me from the OR, so I'm yours for 10 15 right. minutes. So please, if you have Dr. we start with Dr. Gamal. If you have a question, please raise your hand, Dr. Gamal Amira. Hello, Masal Khair of Dr. Karim. Ah, Dr. Gamal is like Habib Wahishni. والله انت وحشني اكتر الله يسعدك يا باشا عامل ايه؟ انت الحمد لله تمام طبعا محاضره رائعه از يوزوال والسؤال حضرتك وريتنا صوره كده لنيورو اندوكراين تيومر وليفر متاستاسيز يعني فيري بيج اماونت او فيري لارج اماونت كل الابدومين فالحاله دي حضرتك عملت لها Intestinal transplant, يعني the results if حالة زي كده with such widespread metastases. Ir ir نسبة the recurrence ردي في الحالة دي. Well, I didn't know the patient. I explained. I show you. I'm I'm confused. You're talking in general, you mean, or about the patient? Patient in general, مثلاً يعني because you showed a case. Of very massive tumor in the abdomen and widespread liver metastasis. So, so right. what are the results in such cases when you remove and you do a transplant afterwards? All right. Now, I think we we'll, uh, we'll let me explain things a little bit in a better way. The, most of the patients with a neuroendocrine tumor, uh, they have in some sort impaired immune surveillance. And I always try to avoid transplant if I can. The patient I showed you, this is a massive reductive surgery, reduced most of the tumor burden. And he's two years out, he's 69, 70 years old, and the risk of transplant could be a lot higher for him. He, I give him the choice, this particular patient, and give him the choice between multi-viscera or try to do some reductive surgery. Now, for transplant, I put a selection criteria. Patient should not have extra organ disease. You don't go and do neuro, you don't go and do multi-viscera transplant for a patient with neuroendocrine tumor all over the place. No. Uh, you know, uh, you could have some infiltration to the piece of the diaphragm. That's why staging is very important. But if you have patient with veritoneal seeding or massive lymph nodes paraaortic, this contraindication for transplant because you're not going to cure him. The trick with the neuroendocrine tumor, you have to target the primary site. That is the problem that the guys from Tennessee uh, uh, did not pay attention to when they give the liver transplant to Steve Jobs, because he will have recurrent, because the primary site, if you can't identify it, definitely with the immunosuppression you're giving them, absolutely they're gonna have recurrent disease. So you have to be very uh, selective and you cannot transplant to this patient unless you're 100% sure you are eradicating the primary site, which you don't know what it is, and any other radiologically or operatively visible tumors. My take in patient with just a tumor 
with the neuroendocrine tumor, if you have, if the patient, young patient, good candidate, and have liver started with metastasis, it doesn't bother me. It doesn't bother me at all, because as long as you're gonna replace the organ with the tumor in, it doesn't matter if five or 10 lesions. It's different than hepatocellular carcinoma. It's different than even than metastatic adenocarcinoma of the colorectum. Did I explain things to you? Yes, yes. Uh, Thank you. Thanks. We have another question, but uh, I don't know. Please introduce yourself and uh, I have a question from ASD. Introduce yourself and ask. Yes, uh, 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 I'm Ashraf Sohi. I'm a MD surgical oncology at the Aurum. Hello, sir. Thank you. Thank you for the time. 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 Thank you for تضيع وقت لو على الله ان شاء الله يكون كل اللي سمعونا الحاجات دي تتنقل معاك في اوضه العمليات او انت بتشوف العيان ده اللي انا بهتم بيه تمام يا فندم ان شاء الله باذن الله ان شاء الله الحقيقه انا السؤال يعني الكومون طبعا في مجال الفيلد ترانسبلانتيشن هو الديسيز دونر والليفنج دونر في الليفر بقى في الرينال دونر وفي الكومون يعني الاونه الاخيره ظهر ترانسبلانتيشن فروم انيمالز او فروم انا مش 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 سامع كويس وبكلم ببطء شويه حبيبي علشان ايه الكلام مش قادر افهم انت عارف انا راجل عجوز ف وداني مش مش حريفه زيك يعني كده ببطء عشان افهم قول السؤال دايركت قول السؤال دايركت يا ريت ما لاش تطلع عجنك كده يعني قول لي السؤال ايه وانا تحت امر لان انا مش مش قادر اسمعك بالظبط كويس ماشي يا فندم انا سؤالي هو المعتاد في الفيلد اوف ترانسبلانتيشن هو الليفنج دونر وديسيزد دونر في الاونه الاخيره ظهر الترانسبلانتيشن فروم انيمالز سبيشلي فروم ذا بيج يعني اي دونت نو از ات اكسبيرمنتال ولا هل في مثلا اكسبيرينس يعني حضرتك عندك اكسبيرينس مثلا في الانيمال دونر Oh, you mean, you mean you're talking about xenotransplant? Yeah. Yes. So the xenotransplant started our uh, journey was in the uh, at, uh, 1990, 91, when I was in Pittsburgh with Dr. Starzl. And uh, at that time, the regulations were a little bit loose. So we got a baboon liver and uh, we transplanted the guy because he has HIV at the time. And the HIV at that time was uh, liver transplant is contraindicated for HIV patient. So uh, he was uh, usually take the opportunity to advance medicine when things on his side. So he convinced the IRB and the FDA, we can use a baboon liver. We used the baboon liver and the patient survived by 30, 60 days or so but the demand, the metabolic demand was too much for the baboon liver at the time. And then uh, the patient uh, developed, survived for, for, for a month or two with, you know, giving him a replacement therapy, albumin and all the coagulation factors because the baboon liver was not, the functions were not good enough to sustain the needs of the pay of the recipient and then later on died from uh, rejection. Now, uh, at the time, we showed that all the, uh, all what you hear about the knockout animals uh, now, and uh, that may, uh, you must have heard about the, uh, the knockout uh, heart that was done in University of Maryland a week, two weeks ago. And between this time period, we did uh, multiple animal studies, and I did some uh, 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 pig uh, pancreas, and there was a company um, that were giving us a knockout pigs. 
And I remember Starzl was asking me, he said, do you think the Muslims is gonna have a pig liver? <laughs> I said, um, I didn't know. He said, you guys don't eat pigs. So how are you gonna have the pig liver? <laughs> So, um, but there is some um, improvement to some extent with the knockout um, um, uh, pig liver in particular, because it's, a, it's easy to manipulate the pig immune system than the, uh, than the baboon, than the primates. So I'm actually uh, uh, very anxious to see what would be the outcome with the uh, uh, knockout, uh, three knockout <laughs> genes that was done in Maryland a week ago with the heart transplant. We will definitely interested to see. Uh, mm -hmm. I think he, I would love you could ask me a different question. You will say, when can we do cadaveric liver and intestine in Egypt? That is your challenge, uh, young man not the damn baboon or pig liver. Let's be realistic. Uh, I, think, I think it's a shame on all of us uh, not to, I met with the uh, Dr. Tayyib, with regulation mawguda, with mawgood, but nobody adopted the, uh, the idea to make it a reality, blaming the, 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 the uh, Egyptian people will refuse it, you would be surprised. If they have somebody they can trust, absolutely. It will be, it will uh, be difficult to implement. Okay. Huh? It will remain difficult to implement it here. It's too radical. No, nothing difficult. You remind me You remind me of one thing. You can tell Dr. Midhat, the liver transplant to call the legal issues against him, uh, برضو في سنة واحد وتسعين لما جيت مصر والدكتور ياسين عبد الغفار الله يرحمه asked me uh, to uh, give a lecture about liver transplant 1991 زملانا في, الخ... في عين شمس والقاهرة قاموا من نيورو سيرجنز وانسيجيا وقالوا لي انت دمك محلل now you do live donor liver which is even worse than cadaverical it just you have to manipulate, not manipulate, find a way to convince the public what is the, uh, uh, there is a lot of ideas that we can implement to override the uh, Byzantia, brain dead, we know brain dead. There is a lot of stuff we can do to bypass this part, uh, to convince the Egyptian public uh, that they, they, they used to come to me in 1991-92. I said, you're coming all the way to Pittsburgh, I give you a disease, uh, they give you liver from an American, and you're not allowing to do it. Can, was was Abdul uh, Fimagdis Shah, but told me, you guys are hypocrites. They, it doesn't make any sense. So, now, Hatena Kuli, Hatta Dr. Taib Ali Min Sanatain, Ali, Dr. Karim, into Sabah, Mishahn. يا هشام انا كنت عايز اعلق على الموضوع يس اتفضل هو شوف هي انا رجعت هي القانون نزل 2010 بيرفكت ما عدا ماده واحده هي اللي محطوطه الوزير الصحه في هذا الوقت حطها عشان ضاغط فؤاد ناس بطل الشغل لو حصل كده فيري ترانسبلانت ايه الماده دي؟ <تصفيق> إن لازم المتبرع الدونر اللي هو الديد برين ديد ده يدي التبرع بتاعه في الشهر العقاري وما سمحش زي أمريكا وأوروبا ما سمحش الوليه سكند أوف كين إن هو يوافق فحتى الكورنيال ترانسبلانت على المشروع ده ما نفعتش لكن قانون بالصيغه التنفيذيه كله كويس جدا. الماده دي لازم تتلغى فقط وبعد كده نقدر نستيوت الموضوع. لان المصريين هيوافقوا برضك. بس هياخدوا وقت زي اليابانيين كانوا برضك معاكسين شويه. ف والطلاينه واليونانيين اول حالات اتعملت ليفر ترانسبلانت كان من امريكان 
ماتوا في الحوادث عندهم تعرف طبعا التاريخ بتاع الحياة. فهي الماده دي تتشال اللي هي التبرع يبقى في الشهر العقاري لان بقى لهم 11 سنه ما حدش تبرع بكورنيا شوف يا دكتور مرحت بتالي قبل شيل الماده ديت وي نيد ا برين واش انا هستسمحك عشان اروح اوضه العمليات واشوف اشوفكم جميعا على خير ان شاء الله شكرا دكتور كريم شكرا مع السلامه صباح الخير باي